Hey folks, this is Riker, and we just had the absolute longest dev stream for Diablo 4 yet. Over two and a half hours, we're going to go over a summary of what was covered. Tons of information on things that are changing from the Season 6 PTR. Tons of new information about Vessel of Hatred, about the new activities coming to Vessel of Hatred, including the the raid, the Kurast Undercity, uh, sorry, the, the Dark Citadel, then separately, comma, the Kurast Undercity, which is a new time attack dungeon, which you can do solo, uh, plus the mercenaries, just so much information. As a reminder, Vessel of Hatred and Season 6 launch on technically October 7th or October 8th, depending on what time zone you are in. If you want to skip ahead to different sections, follow the timestamps below. We're starting with the PTR learnings. Based on PTR feedback for the big 2.0 patch, they're making some changes. First off, some progression changes. The monster intensity system, which is a system whereby monsters become more intelligent, more aggressive, more deadly and dangerous as you go higher in difficulty, not just bigger numbers, as in like the AI gets smarter, they're snappier, their cooldowns are shorter. That system is only going to kick in now in the torment difficulties because as it was existing, we basically didn't feel it because we skipped the low difficulties very quickly. So now we're going to feel the intensity turn up more as we progress through the torment levels as you requested we can now play penitent difficulty as of level one not that you would do it by level one but let's say around level 10 or once you start putting some gear together you could have that grueling difficulty for those who want that experience or otherwise if you're leveling an alt and you're kidding them out with mythic uniques you can just obliterate content and level up super fast they're making a lot of changes to itemization non-ancestral items can now be masterworked up to rank eight instead of just rank four and they can also now be tempered twice, just like Ancestrals. This is a great change to lower the extreme gulf in power between Ancestral and non-Ancestral items. Also, anytime a Unique drops, it has triple the chance of becoming an Ancestral relative to a Legendary. They've added the Scroll of Restoration, that's the Scroll of Retempering, uh, into the final two steps of the season journey. Plus, there's a lot of other ways to get it as well, which we'll go over later. These are the things, again, that let you reset your tempering attempts to unbrick items. As the balance will be in Season 6, it's actually going to be easier to get a unique with a greater affix on it than it was in Season 5. So far, great changes to both the progression, the difficulties, and the items here. Then they made some progression and player power changes. What their goals are is, again, that... You want to reach Torment 1. In Torment 1, all content in the game is accessible. You can stay in Torment 1 and never go higher and fully complete and max out a build that is giga powerful and could theoretically do Torment 4 all while staying in Torment 1. Accessing higher torments simply, if assuming you have the power to survive and thrive in those torments, that will simply make you more efficient with your time. So to that end, they want Torment 4 to be aspirational content. Torment 1 is the goal, minimum of what you want to achieve, and Torment 4 is just if you really want to push yourself and push your build. This is a stark contrast to how the game exists now, where you must reach World Tier 4. It is non-negotiable. That is the goal. We have to change our mindsets and understand Torment 4 is not what we ought to do, and we ought not feel bad if we can't reach it. I very much like this philosophy. So they felt that people were reaching Torment 4 too easily on PTR, and I agree. So we have this new scaling now from PTR to launch, where the new Penitent difficulty will be equivalent to the old Torment 1. The new Torment 3 will be the old Torment 4. The new Torment 4 will now be the equivalent of Pit 80. And the new Pit 80 will be the equivalent of old Pit 100, which again, people were doing too easily. They've also reduced some scaling of things that buff us to stop us from getting too powerful too quickly, including reverting a buff that they had done to main stat contributing to our damage uh, as well as doing a pass on our legendary nodes which were being they were overshadowing other aspects of our builds talking about legendary glyph powers on the paragon board they've reduced their scaling all great changes then they made some systems changes on the paragon boards they added a bunch more normal nodes they just kind of filled up the paragon boards because the problem was as our radius grew and grew and grew well it's not really incorporating much new stuff because there's a lot of empty space on those Paragon boards, so they've filled in a lot of that empty space. They've changed a lot of the rare and um, magic nodes to be less specific and more generically useful, and they've also buffed those rare and magic nodes. Then, Infernal Hordes. Okay, Infernal Hordes were not available on PTR, and it's because they were, they were basically reworking them. Infernal Hordes dominated Season 5. That's fine. It was a new hype activity, but it, it was just way too rewarding. 
So they made a few changes. First off, we can no longer craft keys to Infernal Hordes. We will only find those keys. That's going to gate how often we can do this activity. Next, they made it that the boss fight at the end will always drop at least one unique item from their specific drop pool. The Infernal Hordes added Infernal Horde specific unique items. Now you're guaranteed to always get at least one to drop. Rewards are going to scale with higher torment. They've updated the chest rewards. There's now three possible chests. There's the equipment chest. It costs 200 ether. There's one chest of materials. When you pop that, you spend all your remaining ether on materials. And there is the chest of gold as normal. Overall, I think this is a good rework to Infernal Hordes. Then they've tuned some other event rewards as well. They significantly increased drop rates and Whispers and Nightmare Dungeons. They gave XP upon completing a Nightmare Dungeon. Buffs to a bunch of miscellaneous things like uh, the Hellborn, the Butcher, World Bosses, Treasure Goblins, all getting better loot tables with better, uh, higher Torment difficulty. The Stronghold XP, they've kept it, but they've nerfed it and they've fixed the uh, Abuse Case. So Stronghold leveling will still be a thing. Now, instead of giving you on average two levels, it's going to give you 1.25. And it's only upon your first time completing that Stronghold. Especially that last part, that's how it ought to have always been. And they've similarly added scaling like this as well to the campaign and side quests. So it sounds like completing a quest of any kind for the first time is going to give you a nice chunk of XP. Also, amazing change now, once you are in Torment difficulty, any, any normal magic or rare item that drops is auto-salvaged. We have the technology! Also, Paragon Glyphs can now drop from the pit. They've made some changes to Mythic crafting. Two Respondent Sparks will get you a Mythic. But two Respondent Sparks plus a specific set of Rune can craft a specific Mythic. Then you can consume a large amount of common salvage materials to actually create Legendaries at the Blacksmith. You just get a random Legendary with a chance for a Mythic or a Unique. It no longer costs Prisms to add sockets to regular gear, only to Ancestral gear. Overall, good changes there. Then we got some class updates. They did not give us an exhaustive list, but they did post, or they said they would be posting full patch notes after the stream. They found that the Barbarian was too weak on PTR as well as in Season 5. He's getting some buffs, in particular to Upheaval, Twin Strikes, Laringo Red Fuhrer, Hellhammer, and Martial Vigor. They also felt the Druid was too weak. They addressed some PTR bugs, including something that was making Nature's Fury too effective. They buffed for the Druid the Great Staff of the Crone, the Aspect of Retaliation, Lust for Carnage, Untamed, Werewolves are going to be strong now, Companion Druids on the rise. For the Necro, they felt that Blood, Bone, and Shadow Builds were doing good, but Minions were not, so they want to do massive buffs to Minion Necro. They also felt that the Necro was squishier, so they gave him some defensive buffs. We're seeing buffs to Reap, Necrotic Fortitude, Kalan's Edict, the Ring of Mendeln, Shade Mist, Aspect of Fell Gluttony, Cult Leader. For the Rogue, seems Rogues just felt great on PTR, so not a whole lot of changes there. They've given some buffs to the uh, Flurry and Twisting Blades builds. So we're seeing uh, buffs to Encircling Blades, Blade Dancers, as well as Reign of Arrows. And they fixed Victimize. It was... There was a bug, it was too strong. They've adjusted it now. It's It ought to be competitive, but not a must-take. For the Sorcerer, they knew that was by far the strongest class on PTR. There was an issue with the Enlightenment new key passive that was uh, making it too strong. They fixed that bug. They still think it's probably going to be too strong. And they're giving some buffs to the super underutilized Sorcerer builds. Uh, buffs to Flame Scar, Oculus, Talrasha's Ring. Then for Rune Words, some big changes. They saw two major issues. First off, some runes were just way overshadowing others. And some runes were just basically completely useless. So what they've done is they've nerfed the best runes and they've buffed the weakest. This is good because the previous situation was there were like two good runes. Uh, there was really no options to take here. And then they've outright removed four runes that they just felt were underperforming so much that they had no usage case. Their design mentality is condense the fun. So rather than just have, rather than just keep in those like useless runes, they figure let's remove them for now, make sure that everything that we do have in here has some use is fun because they're always planning to add new runes in the future so they can always retool them re-add them uh, in a better state in the future but in the meantime they don't just want filler content so one of the op runes was the war cry one that's ohm they've nerfed it now it just gives you the baseline war cry not berserking additionally and the other op one was yom that gave you the druid petrify they've reworked druid petrify such that now the the buff that Petrify gives you to your crit damage bonus has been moved onto the uh, deeper in the skill tree of the ultimate. So the base version of the alt does not give you that. Meaning druids can still keep that, but everyone else who's using it now, all you're getting, which is still very good, is the 
the big stun, as well as a, a nice resource buff. Again, they gave a bunch of buffs to the underutilized runes, and then something really nice and appreciated. Uh, so some of the runes were uh, named after the old Diablo 2 runes, but they had different art. So they've updated the art to now be nostalgic to the D2 appearance. Okay, that covers PTR. On to Season 6 stuff. The Season 6 theme is revealed. Season of Hatred Rising. Now, everything that Season 6 brings is available to people who don't buy Vessel of Hatred. I mean, it's also available to people who do, but you don't have to buy Vessel of Hatred to get the the new, uh, you know, all the extra skill points, the, uh, the extra Paragon points, the new Legendary Glyphs, the new Legendary Items, Uniques, Mythics, all that stuff. Even if you don't buy the expansion, you still have access to it, as well as the Season Theme. And the Season Theme could best be described using this delightful piece of artwork. So, there's this monster called the Realm Walker. It's a world event. You're going to see it pop up on your map with a specific time that it's going to spawn. You go there, Realm Walker spawns, and he's going to walk around and spawn enemies. And as you defeat those enemies, uh, he's going to build up some kind of rage meter. And once he's enraged, he's going to spawn little mini bosses. And if you defeat those mini bosses, he's going to become weakened. His, his health bar is going to drop. And eventually, once he finishes his walk path to a specific zone, he will then become targetable directly. And then you fight him with whatever health he has left. This is again a world event, so there will be other people there as well. He's not going to be as challenging as a world boss, but still it'll be a faster fight if you're there with other people. Then once he dies, he opens a portal to the Seething Realms. Now before we talk about the Seething Realms, uh, this Realm Walker is up almost all the time. There's just a few minutes of downtime, so in general, anytime you pop on the game, you open your map, you're likely to see that a Realm Walker is not more than a few minutes away. Also another cool little thing, before he is ready to spawn, you find him in the world and he's still burrowed under the ground with his portal up. If you get there early, as people tend to with either Legion events or world bosses, rather than just wait around twiddling your thumbs, you can click on the portal and it'll spawn monsters for you to fight in the meantime. This is actually a great way to add a little distraction or something for us to do while we wait. All right, but this is all in service of entering the Seething Realms. This puts you into your own instance. You're not going to be in the overworld with everyone else. This is a new dungeon with new rewards. You go through the dungeon, then by the end of the dungeon, you're going to find a, a portal and you get to select one of like four different reward paths. Once you've selected your reward path, you're teleported to another dungeon and at the end of the dungeon, you're going to get that reward that you selected. Of course, throughout your fighting monsters and everything. And the boss at the end, it's the, it's your reward chest, but once you click on it, it is a cursed chest and you are fighting waves of monsters and elites and whatever. It's actually a really cool way to have a boss fight at the end. Now again, you get a variety of loot, which you're also able to customize to your liking. But in addition to that, you are also getting uh, something called seething opals. These are similar to mine cages and what they do, uh, which is that they give you a temporary bonus of some kind, uh, a temporary buff. And what these are going to do is actually customize your rewards. So first off, while you're under the effects of one of these, you're going to have a 15% XP buff, which is stackable with both elixirs and incense. Also, while you're under the effects of one of these, any monster you kill and doing any activity in the game will earn you reputation rewards towards the Season 6 reputation track. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but that's a big part of the customization of Season 6 is instead of having to do one specific activity, you can do whatever you want. You just have to be under the effects of one of these buffs. And then every Seething Opal has another kind of buff, which will be determined by which choice you had initially made in the Seething Realm, which of those four reward tracks. So you might get stuff that gives you more gold drops or uh, more material drops or more item drops. So again, for that, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, you have an XP buff. Your kills count towards reputation, and you're getting extra materials dropping. The reputation track this season is the Zakarum Remnants. These are basically like old paladin types. And the way the team spoke about them, they kept saying, oh, you know, they're not at their best right now. Kind of, hint. maybe I'm reading too much into it, this, but it kind of hinted to me that they're not at their best now, but, you know, maybe in the next expansion, you're going to play a Zakarum Paladin. And one cool thing about the Season 6 theme is that it actually unlocks while you're doing the Vessel of Hatred campaign. So uh, you you must have at some point in the past completed the, the core campaign. But let's say you've done that and Season 6 starts, you make a level 1 character, you are playing through the campaign of Vessel of Hatred. You will also have access to be doing the uh, Season 6 reward mechanic at the same time. And that ties us into our next 
topic Vessel of Hatred. The expansion specifically. So first off, the Spiritborn. They're making some balance tweaks based on our, uh, our previous play experiences with the Spiritborn. The Spiritborn are getting a bunch of cool, unique items. Definitely lots of potential there to do really fun stuff. But then one of the new events and activities, the Kurast Undercity. This is a new dungeon experience. It is a time attack dungeon. You unlock this throughout the campaign. You're going to access it via the uh, the capital city of Kurast. It's a multi-floor dungeon. You got a timer counting down. It tells you exactly how many floors you have to go through. The map is fully revealed at the start, and you can see where on the map to go. Your objective in this Kurast Undercity is to collect a bunch of uh, something called attunement. Attunement is the word that they're going for. This attunement is basically progress on a reward track. So as you are killing monsters, you are getting attunement, you are filling a little bar. This bar has four tiers. You want to reach minimum tier one. Tier one unlocks a reward at the end of the dungeon. Then every tier after is just better and better rewards. It's gravy. So you have a limited amount of time to build up your meter. As well, if you fully go through all three levels of the dungeon at the end, presumably that's the portal to the boss fight. So you need to be managing your time, collecting the attunement, and on the map, you can see that there are, are specific like pylon things that you can go to. You click on that, it's going to spawn a wave of enemies. And if you defeat them, you're going to get more attunement. Then there's specific other enemies that they're, they're like elites, they're challenging fights, but defeating them will give you more time. So you kind of have to figure out, okay, do I want to take the time to fight these guys in order to get more time, in order to be able to get more attunement? If this is feeling vaguely like the gauntlet, uh, there are similarities there, and they later announced that they're actually sunsetting the gauntlet. With Season 6, there will be no more gauntlet, and they're going to figure out what to do with leaderboards. In my opinion, they should just add them to pits. That's probably what they're going to do. Uh, pit ladder, leaderboard, whatever. But uh, in the, yeah, in the meantime, gauntlet's gone. Undercity actually seems like a much a much cooler thing that echoes some of the ideas of the gauntlet but improves upon them tremendously. But back to the Kurast Undercity here. Once you have gone through the final uh, to the final boss portal, there are three new boss fights now. The uh, every run you're going to have one of these three fights and once you reach the boss then there's no more timer. So you can take as long as you need to defeat the boss. So again, your main goal here is to get to that boss with as many of those upgrades as possible so that the reward that you get once you defeat him uh, is, the, is as good as possible. Now, that's the core concept, but there's more. You can further customize your rewards with things called tributes and bargains. Tributes will increase the challenge in some way, and there's different tiers of tributes. Magic, rare, uh, legendary, uh, I think even unique. So they're going to increase rewards with an increase of challenge by doing stuff like decreasing how much time you have, decreasing your potion spawn, stuff like that. If you apply a tribute to, to a run, which you don't have to, but if you do apply a tribute, then you can also apply a bargain. The bargains will further customize the rewards uh, at different uh, material costs to you. Like it could cost you like 50 million gold for like a really good bargain. But some of these bargains, for instance, is the is that you're going to get guaranteed amulet drops with passive skill bonuses on them. If, if you've ever followed a build guide that's recommending, oh yeah, just get this amulet with like, with like uh, these three passive skills, the odds of getting that are so infinitesimal, it's, it's very frustrating to try to find amulets with good passives on them. So this is a way to target farm that. So overall, this sounds like a nice addition to the game, a way to target farm things. They said this is also going to be a good way to level up. The Kuras Undercity ought to scale with what you're doing and where you are in the game. So some of the weaker uh, tributes, for instance, the, the magic ones are going to give you more like, uh, you know, bonus XP stuff. But as you go later into the game, you're going to get more powerful ones that are more tailored towards what state of game you're in. This sounds like a great way to shake up the gameplay. Oh, and another thing that you can only find in the Kuras Undercity is the Portal Prankster. It's a new treasure goblin that is very difficult to take down because he's going to spawn a bunch of portals and randomly teleport between them. Uh, if you do manage to defeat him, however, uh, you're, he's not going to drop anything at that time. But when you defeat the boss at the end, you'll get an extra chest just from that Portal Prankster. And the trade-off here is that it could take really long to defeat them. So you got to, you know, you're seeing the timer ticking down. Is it worth taking out these guys? All right, on to the Dark Citadel. This is the raid. The thing that we've been calling a raid that they never called a raid. But the guy introducing them and talking to them, Jason Bentley, his role on the team is lead raid designer. So, ha, 
It's a raid. There's a whole quest line that introduces it, and it sounds like it's going to basically be three dungeons. It's separated into three wings, narratively, but it sounds like three different dungeons that you got to defeat sequentially. They said that communication is not required for this, but that it helps. They didn't give a lot of details on specific mechanics, but they showed this split screen gameplay where one part of the party splits off into like a different place, doing some mechanics in one place, while the rest of the party stays back doing other mechanics, and whatever mechanics you're doing is helping the person in the other realm or something. So this is something that, like, it cannot easily be done with having an AI mercenary fill in for other party members. They reaffirm that it needs minimum two people, so... We know that whatever the mechanics are, it doesn't need more than two. You can have up to four people, and they're scaled always for four people. It doesn't get easier uh, if you're only two people. And again, they didn't go into a lot of details on how it actually plays, but they said that there's a lot of hero moments in their own play experience. So there's a lot of opportunity for uh, uh, players to individually have big impacts, be it through completing a mechanic in a dire situation or coming in with a clutch res. The Dark Citadel will have a weekly reward, as in uh, once a week you can get uh, a specific reward, which is like a big uh, a cache of legendary and ancestral items. You must have completed all three dungeons to get that. But then for repeated runs, because you could run this as many times as you want, in this case you're just getting the, the Dark Citadel currency. They're called Citadel coins, it'll let you buy a bunch of stuff. Specifically, uh, these consumables that you can use to help you on your runs. Or to buy scrolls of retempering. Yeah. So again, you can find these scrolls of retempering rarely in the world as other as just drops, or you can farm Citadel all day, every day to get a bunch of these, uh, which I'm sure people are going to be thrilled to find out. Yeah, the deterministic way to farm as many scrolls of retempering as you want is locked behind the multiplayer activity. This is going to go over well. There's also going to be really cool cosmetics to get. It sounds like from Torments 1 through 3, you get the normal versions of the cosmetics, but if you want to get the Giga Awesome cosmetics, you gotta do the Dark Citadel on Torment 4. Alright, then they gave us more details on mercenaries. The first one you're gonna find is Rahir, the shield guy. You then go on a quest line to unlock the others. There's supposed to be a bunch of personality to these guys. These quests are supposed to be somewhat involved. And they also showed this artwork here where you can kind of see the outlines of where they erased the original other mercenaries that they plan to add. But maybe I'm reading too much into some pixels here. So every mercenary has some base perk that they always have. Plus they have a skill tree with uh, two main branches that builds them in two very different directions. And then uh, several other or a couple, a couple other uh, choices you get to make as you level them up. So overall right here is a tank and you can spec him more towards being a protector or more towards uh, an in-combat fighter. Things he can do includes taunt enemies, heal you. Then Variana is another mercenary. She's this reformed cannibal. She can either dual wield axes, in which she's like fast attacking, applying bleeds, or she has this big mace for heavy slams. Her perk is basically the massacre bonus from Diablo 3. Once you get a kill streak going, it's giving you more move speed, allowing you to therefore move faster between enemies and kill more enemies faster to maintain your massacre bonus. Some of the utility she brings is the ability to um, guarantee overpowers for you or to group up enemies. Then Subo's two build options are going with a longbow for either traps and precision, or a crossbow for explosives and heavy bolts. His perk reveals enemies and materials on the minimap, and also marks enemies, which will restore resource for you and reduce your cooldown. Some stuff he can do is drop more healing potions for you, increase your crowd control duration, give you cooldown reduction. Then Altkin the Cursed Child seems to be the most uh, complex one. He's really built around this uh, kiss curse mechanic. So his perk actually depends on which, on how you build him you're either going to go fire or shadow. So periodically, Aldkin is going to transform into a demon. He's either going to be a shadow demon or a fire demon. The base perk, when he turns into a demon, if it's a shadow demon, he's going to make everyone vulnerable, including yourself. That's the kiss curse part. And if he's a fire demon, then that's going to make all of your damage apply burns to enemies, a uh, damage over time fire effects, but also burn your resource. So overall, mercs are there to uh, provide utility. They're to help fill out gaps in your build maybe give you more diversity in your build, maybe let you take stuff that you wouldn't want to sacrifice skill points for yourself to take. And again, you get to pick one main mercenary and a reinforcement mercenary. When you're playing in a party, you only have access to your reinforcement mercenary, not your main one. As a solo player, you have your main mercenary and your reinforcement mercenary, and they must be two different mercenaries. A reinforcement mercenary is a much simpler feature. You pick a trigger condition and a skill that they use on that trigger condition. 
Then each mercenary has their own little rapport track, again, similar to those reputation tracks that we've seen before in the game. This is how you level up your mercenary, getting them more skill points, but it also uh, unlocks more perks from them, plus uh, mercenary currency, because there's this whole bartering system built into mercenaries. From your mercenaries with the mercenary currency, uh, you're going to be able to uh, purchase things for sale. And the the more you've built up the report tracks, the more options and the better options you're going to have to purchase. It could be legendary items. It could be bundles of legendary items. It could be a bundle of boss summoning materials, master working materials. And you can also spend currency to restock their vendor supply. You get one free restock every day. Once you have maxed out a mercenary's renown track or report track, then you can repeat that last one over and over. It just keeps getting you the uh, mercenary coins. But you are encouraged to level up every mercenary to the max if you want to max out all your bartering options. All right, then this stream ended with some Q&A. First off, armory. Yes, they know we want it. Yes, it's in development. No, it's not coming at the launch of Vessel of Hatred. People asked about crossplay between Vessel of Hatred and base campaign players. Yes, you can party up and play together. It's just that if you don't have Vessel of Hatred, then you cannot go to the new regions or partake in the uh, exclusive Vessel of Hatred activities. Then the biggest PTR question or, or point of uh, criticism or outrage was the campfire. Uh, they have heard us. They immediately, upon got, getting the feedback, started talking about what they can do. Um, they cannot do anything in time for the launch of Vessel of Hatred, but it sounds like they will try to find a way to bring back the campfire. <laughs> um, to clarify for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, in Diablo 2 and when Diablo 4 launched, the class selection screen has the heroes around a campfire. There's a lot of nostalgia there. And they, they're they removing that with Vessel of Hatred. And it sounds like it's because they, they were thinking forward to, okay, we're going to get more and more characters. Eventually, it's going to get too crowded there. So we're going to move away from this. But now they've seen how much the how much that has wounded us so deeply. Uh, so they're going to see what they can do about it. People asked about Lilith statues. We're not going to have new Lilith statues because Lilith is gone. But we're going to have new, like, Akarat statues. Uh, they will not, however, give us any bonuses the way the little statues do so you do not have to do them they will count for renown however so it's just a new way to get renown and overall renown is going to be easier to get uh so the new region nahantu will have its own little renown rewards but they're also moving around renown rewards such that you will not feel as compelled to go all the way to the max renown rewards for instance right now you need to get all five because you want to get those paragon points at the end they're moving the paragon points closer to the start of the track and the stuff like extra obol um, max capacity is towards the end they confirm that mercenary progression is shared across alts but every new season you're gonna have to level up your mercenaries again it's part of the uh, power progression people asked if pit level 100 is something that they expect people to be completing and uh the answer seems to be that they built it in such a way that they don't expect people to reach it but they know that players always surprise them so they kind of won't be surprised if someone does it but they alluded to some kind of a surprise that may be waiting for people that goes beyond pit level 100 they said something like you might get a surprise if you go beyond so who knows what's going to happen there but now they're expecting pit level 80 is where most people will be capping out again pit 80 is like the new pit 100 from ptr which was like the, the pit i guess 150 from live server and they also alluded to a discord partnership that's going to be coming up with more details in the coming days so a lot of info there a lot to be excited about lots of big stuff coming with vessel of hatred but i turn the question to you folks what do you think sound off in the comments also folks if you want some free cosmetics in diablo 4 from october 8th to november 5th you can get cosmetics just by watching twitch streams there'll be new cosmetics to farm up every week you gotta watch at least three hours a week to earn the cosmetics of the week you can watch me at twitch.tv slash Riker. Also during this time period, if you buy or gift two subs, you get this horse and four subs will get you the horse armor as well. Also folks, we're doing the Patreon banner this year. Anyone who is a Patreon supporter by October 31st at patreon.com slash Riker, even at the $1 pledge, will get your name on the shirt. And that's going to wrap up this video. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my supporters. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to join Riker's Raiders for more Diablo content.